Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. Up front today, Genevieve Stewart takes a look at a business that has been very profitable for blacks here in Louisiana, and that's the insurance business. And today we have a change in our format as we pause for pride, the beginning of our celebration of Black History Month. Today we go to Senegal via Lafayette as we take a look at some extraordinary rare paintings on glass from Senegal. We'll also explore the connections between the black populations of Senegal and South Louisiana. I'm Rob Hinton, and we'll have those stories today on Folks. everyone and welcome to folks February is Black History Month and today we have two fascinating stories to kick off our month-long celebration up front we'll be looking at a business that has been very profitable for many blacks and that's the insurance business by the 1930s Louisiana had approximately 35 black owned life and health insurance companies more than any other state Genevieve Stewart takes a look back at one of the oldest of these companies and a look ahead with one of the newer firms during the late 19th and early 20th centuries Louisiana had more minority-owned insurance companies than any other state. The history of Louisiana's black-owned insurance companies was invariably linked with two factors, ill health and death. Natural disasters and epidemics would literally devastate thousands of families overnight. These families could ill afford medical care or funeral costs. Something had to be done. Yeah, well, I can hear my family saying about the time that they had the scarlet fever epidemic here where a lot of people were dying from diphtheria and TB and scarlet fever, things like that. And there was a great need to assist families so far as the burying of their dead. And the benevolent associations mainly service the people in, in, with their neighbors, through their churches, and then through your insurance companies would have that. Indeed, by the turn of the century, 1,000 persons per day would die at the height of the epidemics. Yearly, New Orleans lost as much as 10% of its population within a few days. Therefore, insurance companies such as Standard Industrial Life, Safety Industrial Life, and Victory Life were begun to meet the needs of the infirmed. Unity Life was launched in 1907 and by the 1930s had paid four million dollars to policyholders. Washington National Life offered disability income to teachers and professionals during illness. Douglas Life, even then, involved names well known in politics now. Keystone Life was owned by Dr. Leo Butler of Baton Rouge with a branch office in New Orleans. By 1940, Louisiana Industrial Life was the largest of the minority-owned firms. It had assets of a half million dollars and a full 100 percent of reserve on its outstanding policies. Why Michu remembers one of the other older insurance companies, which provided medical care for pennies a day. Dr. Cherie, uh, uh, through the People's Life Insurance Company, they didn't feature burials like we did here. They featured what they called doctor and medicine policies. You could and getting back to the benevolent associations, also the benevolent associations would 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 uh, have a committee that would come and give you money uh, when you were sick, and even sit sit with you. You wouldn't have to get a private nurse. And basically, um, that was one of the um, main policies that the People's Life Insurance Company started out with. Because they branched out into life insurance company and got to be 
a, a giant in the um, black insurance business uh, before they were taken over um, with uh, uh, Atlanta Life. And I remember, I can remember as a kid those days, um, they would, the joke with Dr. Sherry, they said his office looked like the Greyhound bus station and the bus never came in. There was always a crowd of people. And uh, some evenings I think Dr. Sherry would, would see sometimes uh, 20, 30, 40 patients just in the evening hours. And there was such a need for that because they had a policy with the People's Insurance Company and it said the doctor was free. Then they could even take um, their um, prescription and if I'm not mistaken, uh, I know it was, it was LaBranche's uh, drugstore that was downtown, and they would get a discount or even get free uh, medicine. And that was quite a good policy to have. You, you could sit you had a free doctor, and you got your free prescription. By the 1960s, many companies offering burial policies had switched to ordinary life insurance. Firms writing health care coverage either dropped the policies or the companies merged with larger concerns. Now, but a few of the once powerful companies are left. There were just so many insurance companies. I would think that at one time, maybe uh, 20 years ago, there might have been something like maybe 30, 31 um, black insurance companies uh, in the state of Louisiana. And a lot of them were formed mainly because of the reason that, that we formed, because of the Benevolent Association or because of a funeral home affiliation and mainly the right barrel insurance because that's all we wrote during the early days was nothing but barrel insurance, enough insurance to, if a person died, they would have a policy that would assure them of a nice Christian barrel. Since then, insurance has gotten to be complicated and complex. A lot of the families have died out, and we have fewer life insurance companies now. The Gertrude Geddes Willis Funeral Home and Insurance Company are one of the great survivors. Why Dale Michoud's ancestors began building their business 130 years ago, at the same location. The insurance company now has a staff of 100 managing $4 million in assets. There is seemingly little chance of the insurance company leaving the family's hands. So you are possibly the fifth or sixth generation of the family to run the yes. business. Yes. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, Mr. Geddes's father would be the first generation. Mrs. Geddes would, Clem, her husband, would be the second generation. My mother and father would be the third. I would be the fourth, and now all three of my children are working actively in the business. Two of them are even licensed, are licensed funeral directors, and they would become the fifth generation, and I'm very happy to say as a proud grandfather, my daughter has four children, two boys and two girls, and we're sort of uh, looking at the sixth generation. I'm proud of that. Uh, the Purple Shield Insurance Company, begun in 1947, was chartered when many of the older companies were dissolving. Purple Shield has merged 13 other companies under its shield to garner $3 million in assets with 75,000 policies in four statewide. Co-founder and president, Homer Sheeler clarifies what may have caused the demise of the older insurance companies. If anything at all have plagued black businesses, it's been the one-man operated company where when he dies, either the company almost have to start all over again or it go out of business. So the reason that we continue to involve other people is for the sake of perpetuating. Uh, also, we are uh, anti to the idea that if my children don't want it, uh, then I have no need to try to build it. We believe that uh, the boy down the street or the girl down the street have as much right to become a president of Purple Shield as my son do. Purple Shield has experienced a phenomenal growth. Could you share some of the statistics of that growth with us? We have grown approximately 10 percent each year. Uh, we now, our income is about a million eight hundred thousand. We have projected ourselves within the next five years to double ourselves because in this changeover that we're doing now in buying Mr. Dagg and Reverend Tucker and Mr. Finlaw, we are in, uh, putting about a million five hundred thousand dollars into the company. And we're going to change our insurance capacity. Now we can only write up to fifteen hundred dollars and that's not enough. Our uh, average film today costs anywhere from 2000 to 3000 
So we want to be able to meet those demands. So we'll be able to write up as large as we want to write. So our growth in the past would be nothing compared to what we feel that we can grow in the future. What made you think you could compete with the big boys of insurance? Well, at that time, uh, there was a lot of need for uh, what the kind of insurance that we sold. Fact was, when we started, that uh, it was hard for a black person to buy more than three hundred dollars worth of funeral insurance, and we saw that as the economics changed, there was a need for more insurance. So we started off writing up to five hundred dollars when the others normally could only get three. Uh, particularly in this area of the state. So that we knew that there was a need there when we started. Mr. Sheila, you have a very interesting philosophy about the responsibilities that black businesses have to the community. Could you tell us something about that philosophy? We feel that there's a need for black men to establish black companies. It's an inspiration to black boys, even though it's for a guy working in the bank and don't feel that he have any chance of becoming president of the bank, and nine times he wouldn't, then it's a kind of a, a stigma or a presser to him. But I think if he can look around and see where some other blacks have worked that way up to become president of a company, it's an inspiration to blacks. So we feel that we have a social service to the communities as well as a business service. Time now for our Pause for Pride segment as we begin the first of four reports in honor of Black History Month. Today we'll be visiting Senegal, West Africa via the University Art Museum in Lafayette as we share with you some rare glass paintings from Senegal and explore the connection between Senegal and South Louisiana. Senegal is the westernmost country in Africa. It was formerly a territory in French West Africa, but in 1960 it became the Independent Republic of Senegal. The capital of Senegal is Dakar. Maurice Dudu, linguistics attaché for the French embassy, lived in Senegal for five years, and he shared with us his impressions of the country. I remember strongly so many impressions, you know, at the same time when you discover the people in the streets in Dakar, because the first feeling is the street, you know. In the street or in the markets, you see all the kind of public places. You, you know, you are... It's an encounter with so many colors, volumes, so different from Europe. You know, it was my first contact with Africa, and I enjoy it a lot. And the people of Senegal is so friendly. The, you know, we were talking about impression, visual impressions, maybe uh, sounds impression, but the, how friendly is the people, that another very a thing that I cannot forget, you know. Was the adjustment there difficult? Oh, not at all, not at all. You know, I work with the French State Department, and, you know, I enjoy my work a lot. I was teaching a lot in, in Senegal, and uh, teaching French, of course, and, uh, you know, I, I want to, I, I enjoy a lot to live abroad and to meet different people. I've been learning the language of Senegal, so that the reason for what maybe I had a very nice uh, stay in, in Senegal is because I, you know, at the beginning I tried to learn the language. I'm not fluent at all, but it's just to show the people that you want to share their culture and their language, and so they are very sensitive to that and they like that very much, you know. Carl Brasso, assistant director of the Center for Louisiana yeah. Studies at the University of Southwestern Louisiana, has uh, done a lot of research on the relationship between the black populations of Senegal and South Louisiana. Well, when slavery finally gets established in Louisiana, about seven, beginning about 1719, uh, Louisiana was a proprietary colony owned by uh, what was then called the, uh, the Company of the West, and it later uh, evolved into the Company of the Indies. Um, this company had as a subsidiary company the, uh, the Company of Senegal, which was uh, slave, involved in the slave trade in West Africa. I had, uh, for a time, a monopoly in all slave trade on the Guinea coast, which is all of the, the curve uh, in uh, West Africa. Uh, the, uh, sl the company traders were not as aggressive as private uh, entrepreneurs who were involved, uh, by, who obtained licenses from the company uh, to engage in the slave trade. 
and uh, as a consequence they were generally pushed out of the more lucrative uh, slave markets which were then in the Angola, Congo and uh, uh, Ivory Coast, Guinea areas. Uh, so as a result there was only one place where they could fall back on, where the company had a monopoly, where they had a, a sure supply of slaves, and that was Senegal. So most of the slaves who came to Louisiana in this uh, proprietary period, which is when most of the slaves came to Louisiana in the early 18th century, came directly from Senegal. While in Senegal, Maurice Dedou collected more than 150 rare glass paintings, paintings illustrating scenes from the Koran, West African folk legends, and everyday life in Senegal. How did you discover this unique art of glass painting? Uh, you know, I w all my life I've been interested in arts and plastic arts, as, uh, you know, f fine arts in general. And uh, uh, when I arrived in Senegal, I just saw uh, people um, working on sculpture or mask, and it was not uh, authentic art. It was just copy of arts, pieces of art coming from other parts of Africa who are in the forest. Dakar and the s surrounding areas is the savanna, is just grass, it's not forest. They don't have trees to cut the trees and to make sculpture. So it was a bit, you know, disappointing to find just copies. And one day I went to a, a friend's uh, for dinner or something like that, and on the, the walls of their living room I discovered this wonderful just it was 10 pieces and I say what's that where does that come from and they begin to explain to me a bit they didn't know that much they just enjoyed these colors and all that and I begin to be interested when I came back to France I went to the libraries and to try to find out about this art why to paint on glass and not in wood or uh, whatever and I begin to to go to the Medinas the, the, the you know the the African parts of the towns where the people where they are putting that in, in the walls and collecting that and and I begin to ask the people that I was interested in and I, I wanted to if they wanted I, I could buy that and I begin to have the virus of the collector you know the paintings are presently on display at the University Art Museum on the University of Southwestern Louisiana campus Herman Meir director of the museum took us through the exhibition in this first gallery, we're looking at, in fact, scenes that were inspired by religious themes, some by the Christian Bible. <clears throat> Senegal is 5% Christian and 85% Muslim. These scenes, for instance, are depicting a very traditional biblical story of Noah and his ark. Uh, we also have this scene, which is a kind of vision of paradise with all the animals living in harmony. As we uh, move through the gallery, we'll see some of the... Uh, the paintings that are directly related to uh, Islam. Here, of course, is a quite beautiful painting of a mosque. It's uh, somewhat uncharacteristic of the majority of the Senegalese paintings in that you have a sense of deep space here. It's conceivable that the source for this image was, in fact, a, a photograph, perhaps a, a color postcard. Uh, the more characteristic paintings that we find uh, in Senegal are rather naive, not unlike a lot of American folk art, which uses very, very flat color and very shallow space. Well, I would say that here, for instance, this is an interesting painting uh, which, uh, of, of a structure which is called a marabou, and it is, in fact, a mausoleum where one of the prophets uh, or religious leaders would be buried. And in this painting here of the, the camel, it's very interesting because in Islam, uh, depicting Allah, the god Allah, is forbidden. And in this painting of the camel with this kind of closed basket up on top, in Arabic is written the name of Allah, the indication being that the spirit of Allah, you know, exists, you know, in that, uh, in that basket on the back of the camel. This is a very interesting section of the exhibition because we have a number of paintings illustrating events in the life of a very important Islamic leader. He, in fact, is the founder of the largest sect of Islam in Senegal. He was born in 1900, and his name is Sheikh Amadou Bamba, and he's the founder of the Murid sect, which is a very conservative, very fundamentalist sect of Islam. Uh, and he is always depicted this way, in, dressed in his white robe, 
This is a picture of Amadou Bamba in front of the mausoleum where he is in fact buried. And as we uh, go down the, the uh, gallery wall, we'll see various uh, scenes um, depicting events in his life. It's interesting to note often that you'll have some signatures on the paintings and uh, they are usually in Arabic, usually the, the name of the man who made the painting. Uh, in these two paintings, for instance, we see Amadou Bamba accompanied by his faithful servant who's almost always depicted in this green robe. He's carrying the symbol of um, a ceremony of ablutions, this little kettle, which is in all of the paintings. And here, angels appear bringing the letter indicating the coming of Allah. And these are very, very interesting but because here, um, as you know, until 1960, Senegal was a French colony. It became an independent country, a democratic republic in 1960. And in this scene, what we have depicted is uh, the French colonial powers realizing the power that Amadou Bamba had, the influence he had. Uh, there are over a million people who belong to the Marid sect of Islam. And because of his influence, they, in a way, resented his presence, and so they exiled him to the African country of Gabon. And this scene uh, depicts the day when Amadou Bamba is going to be put on the boat and taken away. There's a Catholic priest on the boat, and he has refused to allow Amadou Bamba to pray to Allah on the boat. And so uh, Amadou Bamba goes on his sheepskin rug, floats on the sea, on the Atlantic, and prays to Allah, and the fish come out to observe this scene. Uh, this is the second most popular sect of Islam, and it is the Tijani sect. And this is Sheikh Tijani. And as you can see from the color of his skin, he is uh, from North Africa. He's from Morocco, so that he is, uh, you know, Arab in origin. And uh, his sect of Islam is a much more uh, liberal sect. It, it is not as uh, conservative and fundamentalist as the Murud sect. Um, and the priests, as we move down the wall, these are uh, priests uh, who would be of the Tijani sect. When we look at these paintings here, these again are uh, leaders, religious leaders of the Tijani sect. And you can see that this gentleman here is dressed in much more modern dress, a Western dress, indicating that the Tijani sect is much more liberal. Even this young man here with his French beret is a, a religious uh, Amarabu from the Tijani sect. Now we come to a very popular fig figure of West African um, legend. She is often referred to as the spirit or genie of West Africa, and her name is Mami Wata, the mother of water. She's the water, water goddess. And she's always shown uh, with the serpents. And it's interesting to note that these paintings were done by three different artists, and yet the uh, rendering of the figure and the placement of the serpent on the figure is identical in all three paintings. And she is shown with a young in, uh, figure here in this inset, a kind of a snake charmer who's playing a, a flute of some sort. On this uh, wall of the gallery, we see a number of portraits of the women of Senegal. I think the representation that you get here is quite interesting because for the most part, uh, we do get a number of images of the Senegalese women in traditional dress, uh, wearing you know, rather elaborate jewelry and brightly patterned fabric. Um, for the most part, these portraits served ladies in, in, in two situations. Either they were young and available to be married, and so they would want their portrait done to show them at their best, or they had recently been widowed and, in fact, were available uh, for marriage. In this area of the museum, we have a number of images which will either depict modern-day political leaders or uh, scenes from everyday life. And this portrait uh, is a portrait of the first elected president of Senegal, and his name is Leopold Sedar Sangar. What's very interesting about Mr. Sangar, he's quite an extraordinary individual. Uh, he is a world-respected poet, writer, statesman. He is Christian, and Senegal is only 5% Christian. What is remarkable about him being elected president uh, is that you had an 85% Muslim majority. 
He was so respected by the population, I think all the Muslims must have felt that perhaps he would be more diplomatic uh, being a Christian and that would, he would deal more equitably with the various Muslim uh, groups. Very, very popular man. He served four consecutive terms, over 20 years, as president of Senegal. He's now living in Paris where he's writing a book and uh, we're very pleased because he has written the introduction to the catalog that we're publishing uh, with, in conjunction with this exhibition. Uh, these paintings, it's interesting, these two portraits are actually death portraits. They are portraits of a woman who has died and that's the reason for the, the lack of pigmentation in the face. Uh, these paintings are particularly interesting because of the sophistication of the drawing. They are less characteristic of the traditional Senegalese painting in the sense that this person obviously uh, you know, has quite uh, sophisticated uh, ability with the uh, India ink. The scenes, the two lower scenes, are depicting uh, musical performances on traditional stringed African instruments. And the upper scene uh, depicts a man who uh, obviously is, is a herder and, and he uh, you know, owns cattle and, and goats and so on. These are, are four of the most colorful paintings in the show and they are portraits, if you will, of sacrificial lambs. During the yearly cycle of Islam, a, a ritualistic uh, ceremony takes place in which a lamb is sacrificed. And these are, of course, very beautiful. They, I think, attract our modern eye from the standpoint of, you know, the kind of geometric patterning, the very flat color, which we actually find in a great deal of modern art, art of the 20th century. Uh, so they appeal to us in that sense as well, in, a, in addition to their narrative or story uh, context. Maurice de Dieu, I think, has been very fond, uh, in particular, of the paintings of roosters and hens that he found in Senegal. Uh, we again find varying degrees of sophistication. In many cases, uh, the artists seem not to have paid a great deal of attention to the way that the rooster is actually made, you know, in terms of the way that the feathers attach to the body and so on. What they've actually done is come up with visual equivalents, you know, uh, visual uh, uh, symbolic forms and shapes and lines to represent this idea of rooster, for example. Here is, I suppose, one of the more sophisticated renderings, which I believe would show, uh, you know, influence perhaps from the northern part of Africa. By the way, if you happen to be in the Lafayette area soon, I suggest you check out the narrative paintings. It really is a remarkable exhibition. The Senegalese paintings will be on display at the University Art Museum on the University of Southwestern Louisiana campus through February 15th. Well, that's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week with another special report in honor of Black History Month. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB.